All right. So we're going to go here to my left, which is this Democrat. Very easy to do. Uh, um, yes, sir. I'm wondering if there's ever been. Uh, well, I'm sure there has been. What's your name? Speak Yeah. What's your name? My name is Jordan. I'm a two at the law Your name is Jordan? Yes. That's one of my favorite names. <laughs> it's, it is. If I have a child, if God, you still. You know, Shmuley, you, why have a rabbi in your life if they're not going to help you find your beshert? Um, so I, I don't understand that. So I am still childless. But I, Abraham was really old when he had a kid. So, uh, so there's still hope for me. But Jordan, if I have a child, I want to name them Jordan. I hope it's a daughter, though. Uh, but, but, but I've thought this all out. I'm like one of these kids. You know, the whole wedding's planned out. You don't even know who you're going to marry yet. Anyway, but Jordan is my mother's maiden name. Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead, Jordan. I'm curious of, like, of if you could give an example of when your spirituality has conflicted with like necessary policy making or work in the government and how you try to reconcile this. That's great. Did you guys hear what he said back in the back? Yeah, he basically said, how is it a man as handsome as you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he, he asked, uh, can, you, can you tell about a time that your spirituality may have conflicted with things you were trying to work on and how did you resolve those conflicts? Um, I, I, I honestly don't think there's conflicts. <laughs> my moral compass has always um, been my guide. Um, there's definitely been times where I've been, had to be tough and hard, especially in my mayoral days. But the times I feel like I've done things that didn't resonate with my moral core, I regret that. I feel like I was wrong. Um, you know, I still am haunted by a, a person I fired that my then chief of staff and others were saying he, viol he did something politically wrong and I, it just felt so wrong to me. And I let them fire the person. And to this day, and that was you know, 20 years ago, I still, or in 2006, I should say, uh, I still regret that. And it did, it, at the time, it didn't resonate with my, my moral core. And, and so as I've gotten older, I've, I've listened to that voice inside of me that says, this, what you're being told to do here is wrong. Now, there are times that I'm getting better, like, you know, um, and I haven't talked about this with my team, like, I called for somebody to resign that said something stupid and arguably bigoted. Uh, a na another national figure, not in my state, said something stupid. And even at the time, my staff was pushing me to get out there and call for this person to resign. And it didn't sit right to me. Like, this isn't my state, this isn't my turf, this person did something wrong. And, and I know this is hot to be on campuses, like, and it was decades ago. I said stupid, dumb things that could be seen as bigoted 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And so there's, the, the, I see all those moments when, I, when I'm not listening to my in, in, internal sort of voices as guideposts. And when I go in the wrong direction, don't lose the lesson, learn from them. People who tell me, like, um, there's a lot of political discussion now about like, I hear this all the time. Well, Democrats, you're too nice. You, you're like, you don't play hardball. You know, uh, I, even when I was running for president, people were like, oh, you're, you, you're just nice. I'm like, wait a minute. First of all, there's a movie about me called Street Fight. <laughs> I fight hard. But why do you have to be mean? Why do you have to be cruel? Why do you have to do immoral things to get to a moral end? Uh, uh, to think that's going to get you to a moral end. Because I believe what Gandhi said, that the means and the ends should always align. And so that's what I strive for. Thanks, Jordan. Yes, sir. Um, two guys. Name. The next two questions have to be two women. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> Balanced. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so my name's Olu. Um, I'm for our school. I was just wondering, you know, I think to be a young person these days is to have lived through you know, at least two financial crises, and what feels like in many ways kind of, you know, a country coming apart at, at its seams, you know, the very foundation of democracy itself kind of coming into question. And um, I guess I was just wondering, how do you remain so kind of positive and optimistic um, given this kind of environment? What do, you, what do you kind of do to sort of make yourself like stay hopeful? Look, so first of all, I, I, I've learned also to, to, to be careful about the stories we tell. Because yes, I, I have objective measures that things are, you know, we're in a tough spot. You know, I mean, we're, 
and the Gallup keeps a measure of trust, like how much do Americans trust each other, how much do they trust their institutions, how much do they trust the media, and we're at the lowest level that Gallup has ever measured. These things bother me because they erode community. But I also know as I travel around the country, I see, un and, I, and because I, I put this energy out, I often attract these stories, millions of acts of grace and kindness are going on across aisles, across religions. You know, I saw it in my community when uh, there was an incident at a synagogue that, you know, Muslim communities just tripped over themselves to wrap themselves around. That, I, I mean, I could go on for hours about these beautiful stories that never get into the national conversation. And so we hear all this noise. It makes us think that things are bad, 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 bad. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stipulate that I think things are, that we have a, a problem. But I'm also going to say that we all have an obligation to balancing that story out. Like, you know, I have friends that watch the news and suddenly they're worried about Africanized bees. Like, oh my God, I'm a terrified. Because they're, every day our social media and our traditional media is very much geared towards scaring you. It's very much geared towards telling you the worst story. What I told in the so talk I gave yesterday is about Van Jones and, and uh, Newt Gingrich had this show called Crossfire. And Van was telling me that, you know, I love what Brene Brown says. She says, it's hard to hate up close, so pull people in. Mm -hmm. and, and so the two of them sitting next to each other realized they liked each other. Mm -hmm. And they agreed on a lot of things. And they went to their producer and said, let's do a final segment called Ceasefire. And they, and they did it and only lasted a handful of shows because it's the, they stopped them. At, because they said ratings were going down. So the corporate models of our media are all about how much can I make you watch this screen. I remember one of the reporters from my state's largest newspaper, the Star Ledger, who said to me, this is the end. They are now paying reporters based upon the click-throughs on their article. Which, what is going to kind of articles are they going to write to try to get people like me when I'm doom scrolling at four o'clock in the morning? Um, um, Y'all have been there too. <laughs> um, um, and, and to make me click through, God, it's going to have to be things that often uh, uh, appeal to the primitive parts of my psyche that, oh, let me see what that is. Or, oh, what is this takedown of this person? Or, oh, what is this gossip? Or, oh, what is this hate? Oh, what is this moral indignation that so confirms to me how bad the other side of the aisle is or this figure? So that's all at work right now in our society, on steroids, supercharged. We have no idea. Civilization did not evolve millennia of evolution before we got screens in our lives. This is just a brief, tiny fraction of a second. We don't know what this is doing to us. I have theories about how it's driving anxiety. And I have theories about how it's driving self-hate from uh, self-esteem, uh, uh, am I enough, this enough, that enough, smart enough, beautiful enough, big enough, small enough, whatever. And, and I have a feeling it's somehow correlated with the highest levels ever of uh, uh, mental health medications that we're taking, depression, anxiety medications. There's, I'm seeing more and more studies about just the light in those hours between, uh, I think, 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. are connected to our, our mood. So all of this stuff is going on in a new toxic brew from the change of corporations. Corporations have changed dramatically from my dad's era to now. In fact, in my dad's era, corporate philosophies were very different. Their stakeholders were very different. My dad worked for a company called IBM, and it was before this terrible short-termism we're in now, where you know, my office looked at CFOs, a survey of them, how many of them have made decisions that are against the long-term interests of your corporation just to make quarterly reports look better. 84% said they were doing that. Uh, a, a, a New York Times had a great article about corporate models and their shift from looking at a janitor that worked for Xerox big company in my dad's era, to a janitor that works for Apple. The janitor worked for Xerox, worked for Xerox, therefore they qualified for their benefits program, their tuition assistance program. They follow that janitor up to, the, to middle management. The janitor looked for Apple, it was a depressing story because that person didn't work for Apple, they worked for a company that was bidding for that contract, pushing down wages as much as they possibly could, and now that worker couldn't do what the other single mother did, raise her child to even do better than she did, the American dream. This worker now had to work two jobs, wasn't home to check homework, couldn't go on and get their own education, which they would have. So it's just a different model we have. So I can give you all these inputs that are making this a very insecure, highly tense, 
uh, zero sum, high stakes kind of culture. And, and so your question about my staying optimistic, um, I draw from my own traditions, man. I'm a, I'm a black guy in America who, my grandmother was born not that far after slavery. The stories of my grandparents, how did they stay optimistic? The stories of my father getting beaten in segregated communities because you step over a line. The, the stories of my family about the numbers of people who were lynched every single day. But I didn't have to go that far back. I live in a low-income community. I mean, I think I'm the only senator that lives, I, don't, I didn't look at the census numbers this time, but, but the last census, below the poverty line, I live in a district, black and brown district, below the poverty line. And you want to talk about heroic people that every day are sources of joy for me, yet their children have been rounded up for doing things that Yale students do, like smoke, take drugs, use drugs. That, that, that their lives have been devastated by the reign of violent crime sourced by the weapons that don't come from Newark. I, 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 you know, I could go on and on and on about like the people I find in my community who are dealing with outrageous realities that we seem to be comfortable with. The land of the free, having more incarcerated people than any other country in the world. One out of every three incarcerated women on the planet Earth is in this country. What we do to women in America is Byzantine. We shackle pregnant women, force them into a level where they're literally making their own tampons because they can't afford to buy a tampon and call their child because the usury rates we charge them. There is so much things going on, yet I meet people in prisons. When I was at Yale, I, I, so that's when I first started visiting prisons. Haven't stopped because my faith, Matthew 25, says show up, be proximate. And I meet these dudes who have life sentences, who take joy. That one guy, when I was at Yale, I never forget what he said to me. I go, same thing. Man, I come in here and you, you give me energy every day, yet you're behind these bars. What's going on? He goes, Corey, I have purpose. Every day I get up and see one of these knuckleheads, because most people go to prison and come out. And he goes, I make it my deal to make sure when they leave, I tell them I never want to see you again. And I've done everything I can to make sure that they don't make the mistakes I did and get on the right track. And that gave him source his joy. So I wake up every single day, man, and I have a choice. I can't, as we said earlier, I can't choose what's going to happen to me in this world. But the two things I have power of is my attitude and my state of expectation. And, and I believe my faith grounds me so much that I know I have a purpose. Already said it, simplify it, is love which is a two-sided purpose. How can I make myself a better instrument of love? By learning the lessons. I already told you about my imperfections and mistakes I've made. And number two, how can I be a better vessel to, to shine love into this world? So I wake up every day with a, with a purpose that gives me joy. And then I just say this universe, everything's happening is to, for a reason. You and I are having this connection for a reason. And maybe, you know, I can touch you in a way that you'll never come back to Yale again. I mean, come on. I'm joking. <laughs> Brother, it's, 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 there's so much reason to celebrate every single day. And if you're having trouble connecting to that, do what I do sometimes, just write a journal. Today sucks, but let me give reasons why I should be rejoicing this morning. And every day, there's a reason to rejoice. And, and, and share that. Share that with this world. All right? Okay. Can one, one more? One more question. Oh, you're, you're being policed by Veronica. So last, last question right here. Yeah, why don't we do that? We'll hear the questions. So look at Veronica trying to take control of my life again. <laughs> Veronica, I'm going to go here. Veronica, do you have two other people that you had in mind? Okay, so where's the hand here? Who was the hand here? Yes. So you're the third and last question. You're the first, second, third. Just get them out. Speak up, please. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. I had a question. We uh, had the chance to hear from Alan Dershowitz just a few days ago. And one of the things that he described that kind of profoundly affected me was the way that his former friends would walk away from him. And I'm wondering, what is, what is a, a way you're thinking about uh, trying to heal the sort of divisions? Because you know, people disagree with one another. Friends disagree with one another. How do how do we forgive people with whom we disagree? That's a, that's a great question. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. What's the state of faith in the Senate? Is there a genuine motivation by principles of faith by your colleagues to act writ large, or is everything still cynically driven by the new cycle and 
perhaps some of the displays of faith by colleagues are not as genuine as they may be. Wow, the state of faith. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Forgiveness, state of faith, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's clear that you see religion as a force of community, but often on the national scale, and especially since Dobbs, I feel like we talk about religion as wow. a force of division. Yeah. So what role should religion play, if any, in decreasing and not increasing polarization? Last question, real quick here. Here, oh sorry, here, yes. Um, I have a similar question to the, to the Senate one. So I don't hear like any politician promote a message of love ever. What do you think um, are the val values that are contradicting your message of love that you see in the political system, how do you work against those? Okay, so I'm gonna try to go real quick, uh, maybe reverse order. So um, the, first of all, you don't hear the messages. Like I was told I'd make a lot more money on my emails that I send to people if I was sending more extreme kind of fear-based messages, like click here to save the world from devastation and destruction that are being caused by Mitch McConnell. Um, um, uh, um, <laughs> um, you know, so, so, uh, the love messages don't get filtered through our corporates, corporations because they don't think they sell as much. You know, I'm proud that I have millions of people following me on social media and I'm developing a community of that, but it's just, I, I don't think you hear it as, as much because it's harder to break through than it is. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't stay doing it. And there, by the way, there are other politicians that I believe that uh, on both sides of the aisle that, are, that do have core of authentic faith. But I, I think that these things will get more lift if more of us lift them. The one challenge I love saying to friends and, and students um, is do a social media audit of yourself. Like literally go through and look at your last postings for a month to six months and say, is this the energy I want to bring to the universe? Is it? Am I, is it a great exemplification of my spirit, the best of me? And if the answer is no, saying, well, what can I do differently? So my, my chief of staff and I know this, I search the internet for stories about goodness and, and try to elevate them on my platform. So I, I, I think we're in a contest. This story I, I did this morning for tomorrow for Diwali was all about that contest between dark and light. And you have to decide, am I a light worker or am I just doubling down on the, on the darkness? Okay, then, then it was over here. Remind me again. Uh, it was, religion and polarization. Um, I, it's tough, right? It's tough. I, 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 and I've, I've tried to really search, because he's talking about Dobbs, like I've really looked for people that, I, uh, of, that are, and, and had some conversations with people that are, really do believe that, uh, and are, 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 are people I respect and admire that believe that, 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 that life starts at conception. Now I've talked to rabbi friends of mine that Judaism has different views on that, and I've talked to Christian friends of mine who show me biblical texts that affirm my belief, but it's, it's such a polarizing zero-sum issue, right? And it's, and it's hard when, when, when a person's religious beliefs, it's not like it's a budget battle and we're, we can just do kind of Solomon, Solomon that thing and cut the baby in half. And so the, where do you go? And so, I'm sorry, that was a terrible metaphor. <laughs> Terrible metaphor. And this is the thing that really bothers me. I'm going to hear about it when I get in the car from my chief of staff. <laughs> like she says, you're doing all right, Corey, until you talked about King Solomon and splitting the baby. So, so, so I'm not going to change that person's view. Like I, I have a lot of love and respect for, for Senator Lankford, a man of faith and principle. There, there's no bridging that divide between what he believes in, as a matter of his faith and what I believe as a matter of my faith. But yet we still have found a relationship. And maybe if we start talking that we can't find a bridge that divide on that, but can we bridge a divide on something else? Like I talk to a lot of my friends who I say to them, well, I look at the states, and this is now dated, so somebody might have a better uh, uh, counterfactual uh, uh, piece of evidence, but. Before Dobbs, the state that had lower rates of abortion the most was Colorado. How did they do it? They gave low-income women free birth control. So maybe you're, you don't believe you're not going to allow me to let a woman make her own decisions, and we'll have to fight that out electorally. And by the way, I'm not fighting you. I'm fighting more of the people that are sitting on the sidelines and agree with me that don't vote. 
that's my bigger battle. But can we agree that states, the evidence shows that states that do certain things lower rates of, of, of women making abortions. A woman who has a child in America, I think it has, well, let's just say a dramatically low, higher rate of falling into severe poverty. We're the, one of the few states that, that nations that allows a woman to size up a child, you're gonna fall into severe poverty. Can we do something about that together? So I, I, I don't dismiss a human being, and that gets me to the question over here. I, I just can't dismiss a human being completely because if I can keep the cords of our humanity up there, there might be some other discovery. So this is to your, to your question. I don't know how to say this in a personal context because there are a lot of competing values that I have. Like I want to source my, I want to spend time with people that nurture my soul, that uh, ignite my soul, whose eyes light up when they see me. I want to nurture a community around me that really, uh, that does challenge me that tells me when I'm being a jerk uh, or when I'm be not being the best version of myself. Um, I, I love this saying like, you know, find friends who know the song of your heart and remind you of it when you forget the tune. And, 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 and so what if there's a person though that like has such strong beliefs that beyond me, should I divorce that person in life to save my own sanity sometimes? I, I, that's a tough, tough value. I know I like my friends who challenge me, who, who have differing views that sharpen my views. But, so I don't know what to tell you to do in your personal life. I, it's distressing to me that we have families can't even have Thanksgiving dinner because they get, or they have big rules. We can't talk about this or it's going to descend. But professionally, I, I don't understand people that can't talk to people that disagree with them. And my favorite story about this is, uh, is a story I told yesterday again as well, but it's, it's my favorite moment where uh, Inhofe, who was a, a, a conservative senator from Oklahoma, is now retiring. Inhofe has said things to me that I find deeply difficult to deal with. Like he, he's a guy I think that believes you could pray away the gay. You know, he's a very Christian family and has, has alluded to things like that on the Senate floor. Uh, he's the guy that brought the snowball to the, to the Senate floor to say that it wasn't climate change going on. And, and yeah, so, but I'm sure there are things that I have said, whether the stupid things I've said that probably just deserve a little bit of uh, laughter, uh, or even some of the principled stands I take. Like the joke I made it, it yesterday was like, I'm sure I've said things that, uh, that, that have, I'm sure I've offended uh, Senator Inhofe. I'm a vegan, <laughs> for crying out loud. Um, so, if I just let those things and, and the people whip that stuff up, regardless if he says something or I say something, our, our tribes whip that stuff up. So we become caricatures and one dimensional people where the only nexus people have often to us are the stupid thing we said or the thing we disagree with and we lose our humanity. So in off, I decided to go to his office for Bible study and um, as an attempt to connect. And when I went to his office, I walk in and the first thing I see that sort of surprised me, that challenged my implicit bias. And if you don't think you have implicit biases, you're wrong. I have implicit biases. My implicit bias is this right-wing conservative senator wouldn't have a picture prominently featured of him and a little black girl. And I don't call my older senators by their first name. Uh, I said, Mr. Chairman, who that? And, and, and he's basically, his family adopted this little girl out of a very, very difficult uh, situation. It was a beautiful story. Months later, there's a big education bill going through the Senate, and I've now gotten to know him well. We have a good relationship. We just sat next to each other at a meal at a bipartisan uh, uh, lunch that Senator Coons helped to put together. And I see him in the well of the Senate as this education bill is going through. The rule is no amendments on this bill. They were not letting them because it could sink the bill. Lamar Alexander was the manager of the bill in the well of the Senate, trying to keep everything together. Everybody thought this was just going to pass. My, my team had this really great idea of an amendment that would help homeless kids and foster kids. But there was literally, we thought, no chance. Every amendment is being blocked. There's no way you can do it. But I see Inhofe in the well of the Senate, and I just feel the spirit of him and his daughter and this child, and I go into the well of the Senate, and I say, Senator Inhofe, I have an amendment. And I talked to him about it, and he listened. 
And then when I finished, I thought he was going to say, Corey, this is, Bill's not going to have any amendments on it. He goes, let me think about this. And I walked back to my side of the aisle and, and sit in the back seats where, you know, again, I've got the one job in America where I can feel really young <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, at my age. And I sit down and I look up and he's marching towards me into the Democratic section on the floor and comes up to me and just sort of gruff, gruffly says, I'm in, and then turns around. I'm like, Senator, what does that mean? <laughs> and, and he's like, Corey, it means I'm going to co-sponsor your amendment. So I had a powerful chairman do it. We got Grassley next, another powerful chairman. And before you knew it, Lamar Alexander accepted the amendment. It's the law of the land. And so imagine that right now. If I was firmly not looking for those human connections, this opportunity, which is my purpose in life, to help the people who are vulnerable, wouldn't have happened if I was firm. But because I opened the doors to see his multidimensional huma humanity, we affirmed what always exists. Every human being has tight cords of connections. We just have this delusion that there's nothing about that person that connects me to their humanity. But because I did that, and I affirmed what the truth is, is that we all are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to common government and destiny, that, that we found a way to help people. That, but for that one human connection, praying together, uh, 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 or studying the Bible together, would, would not have happened. And so that's what my prayer is. That's how, it's a tough balance, because Veronica knows this. I get home on some days, and I just, like, I, just, I, just, I just can't deal. I just need folks that are going to make me laugh and forget about the world for a while. But um, I know that I'm enriched and challenged when I, when I open those door to those cords. The, the last question I didn't get to, who was the person? Right here. Did you no. Did you yeah, it was here, right? I think I got the, the one up behind me. Did I get, did I got, okay, yes. So your question was, I think one of the best uh, summaries of all the things we just talked about, which was in the Senate, um, the people of faith. So I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I've met some of the most faithful people I have met are atheists. Really, some of those moral people I know are atheists. Like this idea that you profess your religion and you're ascribing to a religion, but nothing I witness, and again, you're a multi-passing human being, but it shows me your religion. I always say, before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. You know, before you tell me about how much you love your God, show it to me you know, about how much you love her children. And, and so I, there's, I don't know what it is. I have a trigger, and I've told you I need to work on my triggers, but religious hypocrisy is one of my great triggers. <laughs> you know, people who profess their faith but then do cruel, mean, horrible things to other people. Um, um, and so I don't judge often the faith of a person by them professing it. You know, some of my friends in the Senate are people like Mike Lee and Langford, who I told you about, who, yeah, one's a Mormon, one's uh, 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 a, a, a devout um, Christian. But to me, I see their faith more by how they treat the people who work the doors in the Senate. You know, what, how do they treat their colleagues when nobody's watching? How do they talk about people when they don't think they're listening to them? And so I, 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 I struggle with religiosity in America. Um, you know, I, I'm a Christian, and sometimes I just hear people are reading in their Bible their own political beliefs. You know, they, 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 wrap, they warp their religion around, and this is terribly judgmental, but it just seems they warp their religion around meanness. And, and the Bible talk about my family. The Bible's been used to justify racism, slavery, uh, uh, misogyny, um, anti-LGBTQ uh, 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 policies. So I, I, I try to be somebody that connects in the Senate around issues of goodness and decency and mercy and love. And there is people on both sides of the aisle, as imperfect as we all are, that aspire um, ultimately to that. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll end with this. Look, I, it's weird, guys, to be back here and to be a United States Senator. I, I, maybe Shmuley had these ideas for my life, but um, <laughs> I, I would have laughed at you if you told me that, hey, you're going to, in, in less than two decades after leaving Yale, you're going to be a United States Senator. I'd be like, just just no blanking way. Um, but, you know, life is about purpose, not position. 
it's, a, it's like the toughest question I think we all have to ask ourselves. This is why I've kept journals over the years. It's like, okay, blank page. Why am I here? Why, why am I on this earth? Like, what are my guiding principles? What are my values? I had a conversation with a friend who has kids now, and she says, I'm going to do that exercise. Like, what does this family stand for? What are our core values? If you can't articulate your core values, what makes you think in those complicated moments of life you're going to be able to make an easy decision. Like life has become very easy for me where I have complete value clarification because I know that isn't in accordance with my values and, and I don't do that. Or as I'm rushing along the path of life, one of my values is I, I should, as much as that goal is important to me, I need to stop and engage here because my values tell me to do that. So I have on my wall in the Senate a map of uh, the central ward of Newark, New Jersey. It's where I was first elected as a city council person. I graduated in 97, had a great plan for myself. I was gonna start a nonprofit. By the spring of 98, I'm a city councilman, I'm a politician. The dark won out. I went to politics. I thought I was gonna be running nonprofits for my life. And I ran and knocked on doors and told people why I was running why I was getting politics. I was, had clarity on that. And I keep that map up in the Senate so that every time I look at it, I'm grounded in that life purpose and I don't depart from it. And so religion is so important. I wish my party had a better way of talking about faith. I, I sometimes wish more politicians that are Democrats didn't let faith be a purview of people on one side of the aisle and not just the other. And, I, and, I, and again, I, again, remember what I said, I think that some of the most faithful, spiritual, moral people I know are atheists. But I wish we had a spiritual language and, and, a, and a better faithful language in our public discourse. But at the end of the day, the purpose of humanity, in my opinion, is not to get everybody to ascribe to the same religious beliefs. I guess as a, as a, as a black Christian who founded a Jewish organization, um, th th there's got to be a bigger goal here, a bigger purpose for humanity. Because as much as I think a lot about my own morals, values, and purpose to try to guide my life, fail every day by them, I think we have common cause and a common purpose in humanity. I think it's the reason why in that desert, two Americans, two Israelis, three white guys, a black guy, Jews, Christians, why we felt a oneness in that moment. I, I, I think it's why this experiment called America, which from its founding is diverse, why we have captured the imagination of humanity as well as generations of Americans. And so my dream I leave you with, that dream I think evidenced at the Lorraine Motel, the dream of my greatest hero whose statue sits on my desk, Harriet Tubman, who loved this country, was willing to die for it. The dream of immigrants, many of whom are in this room. I think that's the binding purpose. And my hope is that those values at the core of that purpose went out at a time that I see them flickering a bit. And the only way they win is not hoping for it, not praying for it, not wishing for it, not waiting for someone else to do it. The only way is that when you open up that book, tell yourself that this is my morals, this is my values, but I've inherited way too much from this country not to understand that I have to pay forward something and that I'm going to be a part of making the light, the torch of America, not flicker, but burn brighter in this world. Thanks. Everybody. A woman of great mercy and charity. <laughs> she allowed that man to marry her. Yes. Corey, I first met Corey at my engagement party in February of, uh, let's see, 19, 
97. Yep. And um, Corey, you, there's a reason why we're all here today to see you. People have rearranged their schedules because you are still who you were when I first met you. And um, the, the, the spirit that continues to has come with us from Crown Street to this building through the apartment that we're, we were in temporarily never leaves. Your soul is still here, and um, I just want to thank you again for coming. And uh, and I hope to. Uh, I, I I don't know where your future go will go. I mean, I have I have I have visions, um, by God willing. Um, but I, I just married and children. Is that <laughs> <what you're doing? laughs> Some of the things. Um, maybe a big White House somewhere. Um, but I uh, I just want to thank you all for being here, and I think. Um, I think it's important that we had these conversations today. Corey, you answered a lot of questions that I think people are grappling today um, here on campus, and possibly this generation really doesn't have very many answers for um, the questions that were asked. And I think that you gave us something really compelling to think about. I can tell by the faces in this uh, in this group here that this was an incredible, extraordinary morning, and I want to thank you for that thank personally you. because I've been here. We've been living here for 20, almost 26 years now, and. Um, this is probably one of the most powerful events I think that I've been at where you have actually just, you've, you've crystallized the, the feelings, the emotions, the struggles, the loneliness that people are feeling in this generation and there's, there's, it's priceless. So thank you so much and I want to thank also your team, amazing yeah. team. Yeah. Andrew,